Huh? Huh? And the sound on it. Yeah. Oh, oh. There was a beautiful fox there. Oh, you can't. It's too late. There was a fox here. Ah. We found slopes with a good slope, like uh, in the minor hall, for instance. We have some slopes here. And put uh, some of the uh, uh, architects in corners and another ones on the stage to see how big we marked off how big the hall was. And here we made the whole opera house on the ice and snow. And it was ice, minus, minus, minus 10 degrees. This lake was frozen and there came a layer of snow, perhaps half a meter. Then we marked the, the whole opera house in the ice to see what we were actually doing on our small drawings, <laughs> because it's 200 meter by 100 meter. And then we went to some slopes here and found slopes which had a similar slope as the minor hall. And again, we sat there as audience and performers in the right distance to feel it. And then we made the big models and small models because it's not so easy to find places where you can do that. To draw in the snow, you know, beautiful. He, he, he. You can try to imagine this by models and drawings, but if you're here in the forest, you have this happening over and over again, that the tree come out with its branches and they go down in a sweep and then you have nothing underneath. This is a feeling you you, we had uh, in mind with the glass walls that the construction stopped and then you had a view free underneath. And it is a sweep, not a stiff thing. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> American architect Waxman, who wrote a book, The New Era in Construction, which was about introducing uh, in a good, the right way, industrial construction. I don't, he saw this and he said, ah. <laughs> Just one, he got the idea, boom, marvelous. They like the forest, the architects, of course. Mm. Alva also, he said, if I lived in Denmark, I would live in the forest. As I was a, a, a student of his, I said, okay, I'm going to live in a Danish forest. Looked at but cannot be seen, it is beyond form. Listened to but cannot be heard, it is beyond sound. Grasped at but cannot be touched, it is beyond reach. These depthless things evade definition and blend into a single mystery. Understand the past but attend to the present. In this way you know the continuity of Tao, which is its essence. The seen and the unseen the possible and the impossible. Jörn Utzen, 80 years old, architect, lives here in Hellebeck, Denmark, in this modest house he built himself. Utzen designed the Sydney Opera House, but he has not seen the finished building. He left Australia in April 1966, never to return. What any human being would like is to be completely free to use what's in yourself, 
to use every force you have in yourself, every skill. And Goethe, you know the author Goethe, said in a letter from Venice when he studied uh, uh, Italian architecture, he was interested, he said, give me a job uh, so I can devote myself with love and skill, 100%. Then it is not a job anymore. Then it becomes an art, an expression of love. This was our problem. Utzon was 38 years old when he won an international competition to design an opera house, concert hall, and theater complex for Sydney. This young architect came to personify a decade-long struggle to develop the arts in post-war Australia. Now my very great pleasure to introduce to you the man who's made this magnificent concept possible, the designer-in-chief of the proposed Sydney Opera House, Mr. Utzon. Well, I certainly, and Mr. Anderson, we have difficulties in explaining how welcome we feel here, but we feel it right in here. And this morning we saw those two flags, and uh, I'm not here to make it a national thing, but I think we feel ourselves when we make this thing as Australians and as members of a new culture of our time. And you know that there's been hundreds of architects working on the competition. We have worked hard too. So it's up to you in the easy way. You just pay it. That's the easiest thing. <laughs> Thank you. Two men were instrumental in Utzon's success. New South Wales Premier, J.J. Carl, who legislated for the project, and Sir Eugene Goosens, who lobbied Carl to do so. Goosens was the conductor of the Sydney Symphony Orchestra, which was still forced to perform in the grossly inadequate Sydney Town Hall. Goosens came from a, a famous uh, family of musicians. He was almost an eccentric. You know, he was interested in trains, he was interested in shipping, uh, he was a keen photographer, he drew, and his approach as a conductor was not to see music as an elitist form of entertainment, but to try and interest the entire community. This is why someone like Joseph Carl, the Premier of New South Wales, could relate to Goosens, because in a sense, that fitted in with the kind of left-wing program that uh, a Labor government had. First of all, the site is one of the, the really great sites in the world. Benelong Point is just really beautiful, the, the way it comes out into the harbour and is part of the total harbour scape. And really, I think, what is great architecture and what isn't great architecture, it's not only how well it works and so forth, but it's the quality beyond that. It's how much does it inspire man. There's somebody comes up with shapes that nobody quite had ever seen before. And, uh, well, my response was uh, that it is not only utterly ingenious in planning, but uh, this is a piece of poetry, you know, it's a fabulous vision. And the one unique thing about the winning one is that contrary to all the others who placed one hall behind the other, uh, because it's a long peninsula and the natural way is to put one here and one there, but Utzon uniquely placed the halls next to each other so as to be able to enter both halls from the city end. The outside followed stage tower, hall, and foyer. Whereas normally a theater is like a boot, stage tower, and number 55 or 50, 30, 38 foot here. <laughs> and would not have been very marvelous on that side. 
So I liked very much when I came to express uh, this foyer and hall and this tower. I was very happy. Here the trick was actually to get people up. When you come up the steps, you see this. You see no buildings. You see the sky and the cells, and you get separated from being between houses. I thought a movement, slow movement, by people uphill, where they somehow see the sky and the head, and then suddenly come up and see the sea and the horizon. This procession, I liked very much. I liked processions very much. You get to another world, and that's what you want for the audience, to start already to separate themselves from the daily life. Utzon was an environmental designer. His thinking didn't stop at the boundary of the building. His thinking continued on to create links and sympathetic connections with the rest of the city. And that's a large part of his success because his building provides all these connections with the water, with the garden, with the sandstone rock faces, with the city buildings in the quay. It's about building relationships between the building and its surroundings. It is said that the ancient architecture of Japan was based on an attitude of mind, upon a philosophy. And it was this attitude that influenced technical production and not the techniques that influenced the philosophy. Today, we possess no vitalizing philosophy that can influence everything. In its place, we have something else, however vague it may seem, an attitude toward humanity. Production must no longer be based solely on a mechanistic outlook. The machine must be guided in such a way that its products stem directly from a human point of view, as they did previously through their direct contact with the human hand. Jörn Utzen was born on the 9th of April, 1918, in Copenhagen. His father, Orge Utzen, was a naval architect and director of the shipyard in the Danish port of Aalborg. Utzen gained a strong sense of the practical from the shipyard, an understanding of materials and the importance of models and prototypes to design and construction. After graduating with a master's degree in architecture from the Danish Royal Academy of Fine Arts, Utzen worked for three years in the offices of the noted Swedish architects Paul Heitkist and Gunnar Asplun. But it was the experience in 1946 of working with Alva Alto, one of the greatest of modern architects, that had a lasting impression on the young Dane. If, if you look out here, you see a field with flowers and, and a small bush uh, uh, and small trees and big trees. They are all consisting of small elements. And if you take them off and put them up on the table, it's a number of elements. Together they make this. And in architecture, you have floor, you have walls, you have windows, doors, and you have uh, a lot of materials. So when you select them, you must have in mind that they make a, should make a hole or an expression of some kind. Utzon was influenced by Cromborg Castle at Elsinore and the Gothic cathedrals. Forms against the horizontal line of the sea. Forms that look different from every angle, nothing constituting weight. But Cromborg Castle has another story to tell. It is the setting for the Shakespearean tragedy of Hamlet. In March 1956, Eugene Goossens was arrested at Sydney Airport. He had fought for a decade for the Sydney Opera House, but now, less than a year before Utzon's winning entry, Goosen's career was in tatters. Found guilty of customs offences, which he denied, within a few months he had resigned 
and left Australia, never to return. If Goosens was the father of the opera house, Jörn Utzen was the princely Dane who would inherit it. Well, here we are, leaving in a few minutes, and we could tell you just about the opera house. Everything is positive, successful. We're going back home, uh, producing plans for the house with a big auditorium, 3,000, with a small auditorium on 1,200. And these plans would be the preliminary sketches for the working drawings to be worked out in 18 months. So from 18 months from now on, we'll be able to put down the foundation stone. I think the atmosphere in the office was, was absolutely marvelous because it was always a good humor. It was always love for the project we were dealing with. I think this office can be characterized, characterized as, as a jazz group. Everyone, everyone knew what to do. I mean, it, it, in a jazz group, you don't ask, you just do. So, so it works very fine. I can't tell you any time where I can say, oh, that was awful. I mean, seven years of my life and that time was straight happiness. We had a big space in the house rented by Utsun. We not only draw, but we built lots of models because Utsun liked to develop his ideas by building models as well as sketches. And we enormously enjoyed creating a new solution to a new kind of architecture and also new, creating a new forms, and which was really exciting. It was very, very busy because we had a deadline to meet and it was night and day. And uh, no one, we, many of us didn't return to our homes where we were living, but slept on benches or whatever we could and uh, started again in the morning. So that's when everything was finished. We had had so much overtime that we could take a long, long, long holiday. In March 1959, New South Wales Premier Carl seized the political moment and ordered an immediate start to construction. It happened in a beautiful way. He was putting down the ground stone, you know, in the first landing as a bronze plaque, Metzi and Helsinor. And there was a big screw with a cross. This cross is where the two axes on the two halls meet. And then there were six or seven bulldozers and a military orchestra. And when it was screwed home, all the members of different parties were up there. I agreed with Kyle. It should not be a political football. It should go ahead, agreement, everything. The bulldozer started to dig down, and the orchestra played. <laughs> and we went ahead straight away. The start was really far too early for any construction site. But I think he, he had his reasons, and he knew very well that the, the moment was there to say yes and go ahead. Another construction would say, we start when everything is solved. But here we simply have to solve this, the problems as we were going on. The government had asked for uh, an, an early commencement on site against the, the recommendations of engineers and architects. And so the foundations were going in uh, very soon after the competition had been won and certainly before any of the technical problems had been solved and certainly before the, the planning problems of the building had been developed to any degree of finality. The structural engineers on the project were the British firm of Ove Arup and Partners, appointed directly by the New South Wales government and not, as is usual practice, by the architect. Ove Arup, also of Danish birth, was at the outset a great advocate of Woodson and his ideas. Arup struggled for years with mathematical formulae to represent Utzon's original freehand concept of the shells. They tried parabolas, ellipsoids and circular arcs, but were forced to concede defeat. 
no scheme could do justice to Utzon's design. It seemed that three years' work had been wasted. Then Utzon took a remarkable lateral step. Uh, the thing was that Jörn came down one morning and said, I can see we are all been pretty dumb, completely crazy, completely dumb. It's so easy, it has to be a sphere. And we all looked at it, he sent somebody over to the shop, buying an orange, and he, he simply de demonstrated by peeling off how the shelves could be made by spherical sections. So we thought if you could get our shelves in that sphere, we could make it of units. And we actually did that, and you can see here now I take the whole compass, the mayor shell, the biggest shell, covering the stage tower, and the entrance shell, and the two other shells, which are um, covering the auditorium. Behind, you can see all this whole group, it's only the half of it. It has mm. a symmetrical part to go with it. This group I took out of the sphere, which again meant I took it out of a form which I could make up by small, similar pieces. And Jack, would you please mm. explain? Yes. So each element of the sphere has been separated as a unit away from the whole so that it can be pre-made, prefabricated, and then assembled together. Now, each of these elements is identical. His scheme was breathtaking in its simplicity and a quantum leap for the project. Woodson formulated an architectural theory based on the notion that structures could be built up from small elemental forms which could be mass produced and from which whole buildings could then be constructed. He called this theory additive architecture. He had this uh, poster in his office of uh, parts of a telephone, and he can uh, frequently tell us people, look, a few clever people can get together and have all these components, and we can speak through the result. Then architecturally, we can do the same thing. He didn't go for the school that say, now it has to be Mexican, now it has to be Chinese. Uh, but he found elements in each of those cultures which corresponded to what he was working with. The platforms as the clouds of the roof, the Chinese with their building code, which shows how you put elements together. Because it's a corresponded to his way to understand how things are done and how can you put them together. No, he had a, a knowledge of a lot of things due to his curiosity. This Chinese building code, which has been in existence for nearly 900 years, showed Utzon how the idea of prefabrication could be raised to a philosophy. With modern building materials, there could be a whole new set of possibilities for architecture. It was designed, and as a simple idea, then every detail. Uh, and you have seen the pictures of the elements. If you go there, you see this picture behind me. Uh, there are many elements, but they all respect the, 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 the spherical solution. Inside, you have this fan, this, um, uh, it's like a leaf on a, on a palm tree. Uh, and it has become a, a marvelous structural expression, like we had in the Gothic ages, where your uh, columns and the, the arches are made by elements on ground, in stone, and put together. And they are shown, and they go up in groups of ribs, and that's the architecture. So it was not difficult to see that we could get that from a structure instead of getting the shells that were made at the same time, just plaster with no expression. Precast concrete certainly was known and practiced in most parts of the world. Uh, building with such geometry certainly wasn't. And I think it was quite uh, remarkable the way these unusual shapes were harnessed to be able to be made by consistent formwork. 
And the whole idea of putting these elements together like a string of pearls and threading high tensile steel through them and tightening them up, as it were, is that's really the pre-stressed concrete that holds up the whole structure. People call it a, a shell, but it's not really that. It was acclaimed very much in all the technical press, both structural and architectural, as the most amazing thing that's happening in Australia. All of the elements in Utzon's Opera House are interconnected. The final solution for the shells depended in part on the interiors. For example, the stage tower in the major hall required a higher profile than originally envisaged, and therefore the low, streamlined look had to be changed. The cladding for the shells and the choice of square tiles also impacted on the final geometry. And with every stage and every element, Utzon strove for perfection. Well, I feel a bit ashamed that when I first met him in his office, one of the first questions I asked him is that, why do you want to cover a building with, uh, with tiles, uh, a curved surface like that? It could be sprayed. And he looked surprised and said, but tiles are the best. And he'd looked all over the world at them, and he'd seen them in the Middle East and elsewhere, mosques covered in gleaming tiles. And then he traveled to China and Japan and seen these marvelous tiles. And he was very concerned with the quality and the actual materials that made them up. And he gave very stringent requirements as to what material, where they got the clay from, and what mixes they used in the clay, till it eventually satisfied him that it gave a slightly rough surface. And this was the natural color, the white. And over that surface was a clear glaze, with a very shiny glaze, which you can see, which gleams in the sun. It tells a story. It is not. A calm building, is, it's awake all the time with the light. You can, cannot make a sculpture better in something that's white or off-white. If you look at the bronze sculptures in, in nature, they're difficult to read. So this support, if you had put copper roof on, on this house, you wouldn't have benefited from the light. You have seen a green, marvelous color. So this was my first and only idea for the roof, and Saarinen said to me, uh, uh, keep it white, Sydney Harbour is dark, the buildings are dark, at that time, red buildings. So it, it's the right answer. A remarkable amount of opposition manifested itself against a series of great faults for the Sydney Opera House. It is not usual for a series of ten faults that rise one behind the other up to 60 meters. The most widespread objection is that these shells are both arbitrary and superfluous, if one recognizes only the functional in architecture. This objection gives rise to a basic question, a question which our period must again answer and decide. Are we prepared to go beyond the purely functional and tangible as earlier periods did in order to enhance the force of expression? There was a substantial amount that I felt was xenophobia. You know, there's this most important building for the whole country, and why should this foreigner get that? Nobody's.